Mark Gallagher, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us and talk about F1 and leadership and all that goes with that. Uh, but let me start by, like, you have a very impressive uh, CV within Formula One racing and things associated with that. But when people who don't know you ask you, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that? Well, these days I describe it as being, uh, I bring business insights from Formula One into corporate clients around the world. So it's essentially a, a business about providing those relevant insights that companies and executives are going to find interesting from a sport like Formula One. And of course, when you explain that to people, they immediately wonder what, what could a company possibly be interested in learning from Formula One. But that's fine, because then I'm happy to explain the detail. But that, that's been my principal activity now for the last six years, since I stopped having a, a, a full-time executive role in Formula One. Uh, of course, I continue to be heavily involved in the sport. I have uh, a business working with a number of drivers, uh, people like uh, double world champion Mika Hakkinen or David Coulthard, who I've worked with for a long time, or uh, former world champion Jensen Button. And we do a lot of corporate work uh, together. Of course, Formula One has a lot of sponsors involved in it. So the requirement for uh, drivers to help sponsors to communicate their messages to their audiences and their customers is really quite important. And that's, I have a lot of fun doing that because that's tapping into my commercial knowledge of Formula One, which is really, that was my forte. My, my personal skill set was around sales and marketing and therefore the commercial side of Formula One, that's really been uh, my background. And then on top of that, I have uh, work that I do within the sport on a consultancy basis. And, and for fun, uh, I do uh, quite a lot of media work. And of course the media you're a sports commentator. Yeah, right? the yeah. media media work is media is important for Formula One because, like any sport, mm. it's it's how we reach our audiences, and I suppose what I what I bring to uh, the media um, dialogue from Formula One is I understand the business side mm. of the sport. So there are there are hundreds of people who can talk about cars and tires and engines and driving and. But actually, when it comes to the business side of Formula One, that, that's something where I have a particular expertise. Oh, can you tell us a little bit, a little more about the work you do with the drivers? That sound quite, sounded quite interesting. Do you like coach them to be able to meet the press and meet the media and meet the like sponsors representatives? Or no, what, what's your role? Okay, so my role there with the drivers is that uh, if you take someone like Mika Hakkinen, uh, He's a two times world champion. He won 20 Formula One races, and in the opinion of many people, is one of the iconic drivers of recent times in Formula One. And Mika has a wealth of knowledge. He can talk about uh, how you manage risk. He can talk about um, the, the winning mindset. You know, when, you, when you're competing head to head against Michael Schumacher, the greatest driver of Formula One history, how do you prepare yourself for that level of competition? And, um, but where Mika and drivers, other drivers sometimes struggle is how to put that messaging into terms which business leaders will understand. Okay. And that's where I provide the bridge. And it's, it's, a, it's fantastic work to do because mm -hmm. you will meet a driver who normally would never imagine that they could speak to an audience for one hour on risk management. Mm -hmm. I mean, David Coulthard said to me one day, you know, I, I can never talk about a topic for one hour. Mm -hmm. But then you prepare them and you get the right questions and suddenly one hour goes like that, goes so quickly. And they, can't, they, they are amazed. And of course, what What's happening is as a professional sports person, they do a lot of things instinctively, mm. which actually we in business want to learn about. Yeah. So what you're actually doing is you're, you're getting the driver to open up and analyze what is a kind of instinctive reaction that they have to certain situations and, 
and things that they take for granted, things that they do automatically, things that is just part of their job, actually those things are really interesting to talk about. So my role with the drivers is developing the content from their career, which then we can draw out and develop fantastic business lessons for sponsors, for commercial clients, and, and then package it so that at a conference or an event or a, you know, whatever, whatever the activity happens to be, that Formula One driver is going to have a wow factor for the audience. Instead of talking about driving, mm -hmm. they end up talking about innovation. Do they enjoy it themselves? They do because they've spent all their careers talking about driving. Mm -hmm. you know, and normally when they meet a sports journalist, yeah. they talk about driving and racing. And it's quite, it's quite a narrow range of subjects. But when, I mean, I did an event with Mika Hakkinen last year in Singapore. And it was, it was a pan-Pacific, pan uh, sort of uh, Asia-Pacific uh, risk management conference. And we spent an hour on stage talking about how he approached risk yeah. during his career. And of course, Mika famously had a, a life-threatening accident in 1995. He was very lucky to survive. And, and so when you get someone sharing with 2,000 delegates their experience of taking it right to the edge of you know, life and then subsequently winning two world championships. So instead of his life-threatening moment causing him to, to pull back and be less competitive, actually he learned how to use that to become more competitive. And uh, it, it, was, it was really fascinating. So, so there's a lot of... Um, it's an, it's an area that I'm fascinated by myself because I do a lot of public speaking. I've been a public speaker for 20 years. Uh, but to, to get some of these iconic people to open up. It sounds like your, your skills and, and methods would be very useful for quite a few business leaders also. They yeah. might be like they have background in engineering or yeah. they're really good with numbers but have limitations when they meet, meet the public. Yeah. Uh, would you have like, after working with those drivers, would you have any, any tips for someone uh, who is trying to like find the language or trying to open up or move into a little other field when talking? Instead of like just going through, running through the numbers, yeah. how can you tell the company story in another way? So that's a great question because I, I meet chief executives almost on a daily basis. And in fact, I spoke at an event only yesterday where the, the guy sitting right in front of me in the front row was the chief executive of the whole company. And this was a very large multinational uh, energy company. And he loved my presentation because he said there were some great messages and, and not complicated messages, but great messages because I delivered some very clear insights as to what makes a business work. And actually, in what he said to me answers your question. What I would say to chief executives is, too often, the personnel in a business yeah. have got so much complexity being thrown at them. Yeah. There's so many complicated things that people are trying to achieve. Mm. Are you delivering simple messages which help everyone to stay focused? And one of the things that I... I mean, there's a story that I sometimes tell from my career in Formula One uh, executive roles about a team that I work with and we, it's quite a long story so I'll cut to the chase. We basically found out that, that our amazing staff who did a fabulous job didn't actually really understand what we were trying to achieve. If you asked 10 people in the company, what, please list our priorities as a business the 10 people were each giving slightly different results. And actually, interestingly, we had, a, we had a number of people who did not think that winning in Formula One was actually one of our objectives. They thought profitability was an objective. They thought, turn, some, some, someone said turnover. Someone even said to us, uh, our objective is to make sure that the boss is happy. 
<laughs> and we were shocked. We thought that everyone who worked for us realized that we were there to win. And what happens over time is messaging can get diluted. Yeah. Um, also, the chief executive that I was speaking to this week, he, he, does, a, he does a monthly webinar to his uh, workforce. Um, less than 10% of his employees log on to the webinar. That means that more than 90% of the people who work for his business never listen to anything he says. And that's his main communications tool. So actually, you can tick the box and say, we're, we're cool, we have a webinar for the chief executive to talk to the workforce. If only less than 10% are listening, what's happening to the other 90%? So my tips really to chief executives are, in a world of complexity, we need to keep our messaging simple. And we need to make sure that if we stop someone in the corridor or in the co at the coffee bar and say, what are the key priorities for our business, that everyone knows exactly what we're about. Um, and I think that's certainly been a big takeaway for me from 20 years of meeting companies. Is it possible, uh, sort of in brief, explain uh, the different leadership roles in a Formula One team? Because yeah. you're referring to that sport a lot. Yeah, sure. Like, who's running what? Sure. So a Formula One team, a competitive Formula One te team today uh, employs a thousand full-time staff. So that gives you the size of, of, and it's essentially it's an SME engineering company, you know, small, medium-sized enterprise mm -hmm. engineering uh, company. So you've got a thousand people, 10% um, of them travel to the races, 90% uh, of our workforce just work in a factory. So in terms of the leadership structure within a team, you will typically have, you will have the, the chief executive, of course, okay? And then you will have heads of all of the different functions, just like any normal business, you know? You, within Formula One, there tends to be a, a very critical role on the technical side. So your technical director who has, has overall responsibility for the technical direction of, of the company and Bearing in mind the company's an engineering business, that technical director leadership is really critical. And then under that technical director, he will have a number of heads of department who will have very senior roles, so responsible for the key technologies. So the key technologies that we have within a Formula One engineering business are to do with uh, aeronautics. So you'll typically have a head of aerodynamics. You'll have a very highly qualified uh, leader who is an expert in that particular area around aerospace engineering. You'll have people around um, uh, kind of vehicle systems. So obviously, a Formula One car is a car uh, in broad terms. So there is obviously a lot of vehicle uh, technical um, uh, roles which have to be have to be covered. And then finally, you'll have this uh, whole area of what we will loosely call information technology but it's actually quite a broad house uh, these days, as we know, because um, there's, there's so much at stake in that regard. So on the technical side of the business, you've got this overall leadership role supported by key heads of these technologies and departments, and, uh, and how they work together obviously determines the output in terms of creating that car. But then, just like any other normal business, we've got the senior commercial roles, we have the senior operational roles, financial management, HR, you know. So, so you will typically, in a, in a team of a thousand uh, staff in Formula One, you will have somewhere between 15 and 20 people who will be really in the senior leadership positions across the team. And the, where one of the, um, the real, uh, I suppose, focuses are for the leadership in a Formula One team is to make sure that that group of 15 to 20 people has a very coherent strategy, that there's great alignment behind the, the business strategy, and then that they have the ability to cascade that messaging down you know, below them in the organization. So that, going back to my earlier point, everyone understands exactly what, what we're about. So you have a very competitive uh, high performance organization of 1,000 people. One point that you 
mentioned was, was that everyone should know strategy. But what other things translate relatively easily from that world into business world? So it's, you only have to look at uh, the topics that I'm asked to talk about. And that, that's, of course, this is what makes it so interesting is when I go into a business, I don't go in and, and tell them what I want to talk about. I ask them, what is it that you want to know? So actually my clients tell me uh, where their problems are. And, and you've already touched on one. Um, so how do you develop a high performance culture? Yeah. You know, people are fascinated. How do you get a thousand people to work together? You know, how do you deliver that kind of relentless, sustained performance where everyone jumps out of bed in the morning wanting to deliver for the company? Yeah, you know, let's go for it. And, um, and of course, in Formula One, it's essential to have that because we literally race the competition in front of the world's media every two weeks. Our success and our failures are very public. So therefore, we really need everyone to push it hard. But then when you start looking at some of the other areas, um, a really significant one over the last five years has been digitalization. How does, Formula, how does Formula One as an industry embrace digitalization? What, how have we used big data? Um, and of course, the big, the big data story has moved on because you know, big data, is, we've had a lot of data for quite a while, so it's, it's more about how we use the data. So data analytics, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. And I think there what's interesting is anything that I can share from a, a high technology sport like Formula One where innovation is clearly an impor important part of what we do, uh, that helps business leaders to understand, okay, so in a sport like Formula One, here's how digitalization has had an impact, here's what they're doing with it, this is these are the key, the key areas and these are some of the key learnings. And, and, and it's, it's, it's fun to share that digitalization story because when we take, a, when we take a, a parallel topic like how we manage risk, the, one of the reasons we are so good at risk management in Formula One today, literally protecting the drivers, is because of digitalization, because of big data, we, we use information technology to guarantee a positive outcome. Mm. So actually our management of risk has been transformed because of digitalization and big data. Um, Closely related to that is, is the whole aspect of how do you create an innovation culture? You know, how, how do you create a culture where people are willing to experiment? Because of course in a lot of businesses, if you use the word experiment, people think, wow, that's frightening, you know? Because when you think of an experiment, you think of a mad scientist trying some crazy idea. So, so business leaders don't generally like to use the word experiment, and yet business leaders love to talk about how innovative they are. Well, you only get innovation really by experimenting. And what you therefore find within Formula One is that we, we look at opportunities where we can question an established way of doing something, mm -hmm. or we can bring in a technology from another, bit, another industry maybe. And so what we do is we will trial we will trial something, you know, we will look at how a particular process or technology can be uh, developed that's going to be innovative within our industry. And then if it works, we can scale it and we can bring it right into the center of what we do and that, that helps us to move forward. So developing that innovation culture uh, is another one. And I'm going to, I'm going to finish with probably the topic that you might find quite strange that business leaders around the world really want to hear about from Formula One, which is how you develop a health and safety culture. Now, here's a topic that doesn't feel very sexy. So health and safety. And well, if one makes it sexier, then... You know, health and safety. Way, yeah. So if you think, and, and I think when you talk about health and safety, people, people kind of think about maybe an employee getting injured at work or something, which, you know, which obviously can happen in any business environment. But actually, you don't have to think about this topic for too long to realize that if, if you have people working in the energy sector, 
you have people working in renewables or particularly in the uh, oil and gas sector. If you've got people working in aviation, you've got people working in, in anything where there's a heavy engineering aspect, the, the potential for having a catastrophic accident, like, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about an accident where people are going to lose their lives, the, the possibility of that happening is actually there every day. And of course, what you find in global businesses, multinational companies, is that you, you find that somewhere in their recent history, they've had a moment. They've had something that's happened. It might, even, it might have happened in their business operations in another country. But for example, I have spoken on a number of occasions uh, for one of the oil majors. Uh, it's an extremely well-known global brand. They've had a sequence of catastrophic events and a lot of people have lost their lives in that, in, in that business. And the directors of that business are, are truly concerned about the fact that although they're hitting all their profit margins, although they're hitting all their business targets in terms of you know, the numbers, they have this huge problem sitting over here which keeps costing them a human factor, it keeps costing them reputational damage, it keeps costing them. So, so they wanna know how Formula One has literally turned the corner as an industry from having fatalities on a regular basis. We had, we had 45 fatalities uh, between 1950 and 1994, and we have had one since. Uh, so they wanna know how did you turn that corner? How do you go from having a high risk env uh, environment where catastrophic outcomes happen quite often to put a situation today where it really it's almost inconceivable. Is the answer to that very complex or is there like something particular that you paid attention to that sort of is it's, the key to it? So the, 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 the first key was that the senior leadership in Formula One made safety a central priority. So it's a top down, it's a top down leadership thing. Once the leadership gets behind it, everything begin, becomes possible. The second key once the leadership gets behind it, is changing the culture. But it's leadership and culture. It's like anything in business. You know, if the leadership and the culture is right, you can achieve a huge amount. But um, getting people to mandate that effective safety and risk management is central to our business, there's the big step. And of course, if you take the safety story from Formula One, and at the health and safety story, and then you take a broader topic around the management of risk, um, I mean, you only have to look at what happened 10 years ago in the financial crisis, global financial crisis. The global financial crisis was a catastrophic outcome caused by behaviours, caused by business culture, caused by leadership not mandating correct risk management of what happened. So actually this safety and then this risk management aspect, it's, it's very broad and uh, there's a lot of interest in it. You said business leaders <clears throat> like innovation, yeah. but are afraid of um, experimentation. I would think that one of the things that people would be very interested to hear is your, our, your ideas on change management, because Formula One is a sport that is changing all the time. The technology is changing, the rules are changing, the legislative environment in which it works changes all the time. Uh, I understood that like, like that the tobacco used to be the number one sponsor and then it sort of disappeared overnight. Then you have digitalization. What are your thoughts on change management? So it's, so it's a great topic because I am fascinated how many times people ask me to come and talk about change management. Mm -hmm. And then they tell me it's because we're going through change at the moment. And people like to talk about change as being at the moment. Our experience in Formula One is that change is ever present. It's, it's not a momentary thing. Uh, so change and, change and transformation is integral, integral to the business landscape all the time. And when I look at the last 20 years in Formula One, we have seen, I mean, the biggest, one of the biggest transformations is that our business model broke. So the business model that we 
operated very successfully for 35 years broke because for 35 years we relied on sponsorship to fund our operations. And then, as you mentioned in your question, you know, the 2005 European Union and the World Health Organization got together. There was a ban on tobacco sponsorship and advertising. And we saw uh, a major outflow of revenues from the industry, which have never been replaced, have never been replaced. Um, that was very closely followed by the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, we had a lot of banking sponsors in Formula One. Of course, they disappeared uh, overnight. Um, so our experience in the mid-2000s was that the, the, the sponsorship-based business model as our primary source of revenue came to an end. And the sport has had to therefore generate revenues in new ways, which means we've had to, to offer new things, uh, offer value elsewhere, uh, we've had to develop new customers uh, and we've had to do business in new places. So if you look at the fact that 20 years ago Formula One was a European sport which visited a couple of countries outside Europe, uh, today Formula One has nearly 70% of its events outside Europe. We spend most of our time in the Gulf and Asia uh, Pacific. Um, when you look at the fact that uh, in many ways the the loss of sponsorship revenue has been replaced by the fact that we sell events to governments. So we're now in the business of putting on national events for governments in countries like Singapore or uh, Russia or Azerbaijan or uh, Bahrain or uh, Abu Dhabi. So, so we have, go we have governments and uh, sovereign funds who are now customers of Formula One. And then of course, we have the, the broadcast media landscape. So we generate you know, almost a billion dollars of revenue from broadcast partners every year in Formula One. And of course, the broadcast industry itself is undergoing huge transformation. You know, 20 years ago, everything was on free to air television. Then we moved into a phase where everything was on pay TV. Now we're moving into a phase where everything is going to be streamed, it's going to be live streamed, um, and where in Formula One we can, we can sell subscriptions direct to, direct to consumer rather than going through a television company. So when we look at the changes that have happened in our industry, it's been fundamental. Business models changing, one business model breaking, new business models being created. Then of course within the individual teams, Diversification has become the part of the solution. So the McLaren Formula One team uh, today has got multiple div divisions. They now have a sports car business building the McLaren sports car. They have an applied technologies division who sell data analytics capability to companies around the world. Um, they have a consultancy division. They have an electronics division. Um, the Williams Formula One team in the UK, they still compete in Formula One, but I would say their most exciting business is their advanced engineering division, which is selling energy efficiency solutions into businesses, uh, which is developing leading edge technologies for healthcare, for example. Um, so I think when I stand up and talk to companies about the fact that you know, the Williams Formula One team has just invented uh, a portable baby incubator for neonatal care in a healthcare environment. People wonder, well, why, why is the Formula One team involved in healthcare, developing incubators for babies? But it's part of our story of transformation and change. And, and of course, then telling that story begs the question, how do you lead people through that period of change because we have had to keep on top of the fact that our workforce has gone through, has had to join us in this journey of going through radical transformation. Where we do business, how we do business, what's expected of people, uh, the kinds of services that we offer, the kinds of customers uh, that we have. So from a leadership point of view in Formula One, that journey has been 
very significant, so, and it's and it's is ongoing. This transformation and expansion that you explained. Um, do you write that about uh, about that in your book? Um, the business of women. Yeah. yeah. Is that the story is there? Yeah, the story's in, the story's in there. I mean, I, I've I've included that in the book because it is it's such a fundamental part of the of the Formula One business story. You know, for, Formula One as a sport. I would say across Europe, for example, I find probably 10 to 15 percent of audiences uh, actually follow Formula One. Yeah. Uh, but that means about 85 percent of the people I speak to are not actually Formula One fans. But they have an awareness of Formula One as an industry. And Formula One as an industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, we employ, there's about 14,000 people employed full time. Uh, across the 10 Formula One teams. And there's about the same again in the supply chain. So there's, a, there's about 30,000 jobs in Europe engaged in, in Formula One as an industry directly and indirectly. Um, so the transformation of our sport is, is actually quite a good mirror for the overall transformation in business that's going on in the world. and. Uh, it just so happens it's an interesting sport to, to look at. To finish, I'd like to ask you about a personal transformation uh, <clears throat> that uh, happened to you, because I've understood that there was a particular event in Vienna in 1992 <laughs> where you spoke yeah. that triggered you into a new career as a public speaker. Yeah, sure. Can you share that exp experience with us? Sure, that was an interesting one. Um, so I... I'd worked in com senior commercial roles, uh, leadership roles in Formula One for, I suppose, about 10 years at that point. And um, my, my boss, the guy that I was working for, who was the owner of a Formula One team, uh, his name was Eddie Jordan. Uh, Eddie was invited to speak in Vienna uh, at a major conference. And uh, it was one of those big conferences where you, everyone spent months preparing for it. And essentially the day before he pulled out um, for for actually important family reasons he pulled out and uh, this this caused a significant problem and the part of the solution was that the client then asked me to deliver his speech um, the thing is i had actually written the speech uh, so i knew the speech backwards anyway so i went to vienna to give that speech but the the speaker before me was President Gorbachev uh, of Russia, and uh, um, of course a fascinating guy and with an amazing story to, to share about um, the, the, the breaking down of the Iron Curtain and um, changing f global landscape that he, that he caused. However, um, he overran his speech by an hour um, and his speech was in, in Russian. And I think when I took to the stage, I think the audience were simply pleased to see me. And um, I delivered that presentation and it, was, it, went, it went down extremely well. And as a result of that, I got kind of headhunted uh, by a number of people in the audience to come and speak to them. So I, I never realized that speaking to organizations about Formula One could ever be a thing. Uh, could ever be a business, but it developed from that day, and yeah, that's over 20 years ago. Seize the moment when it comes. Seize the moment, and uh, and you know, it was a it was a fantastic thing to 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 learn that you know you can go and do this, and I, I feel very privileged because I've spent my entire professional career working in the sport of Formula One, which I love, and now I seem to have developed this second career, which is actually taking my learnings from Formula One and sharing them with businesses. And businesses seem to enjoy that. And, um, and I'm really pleased to give them the insight. We've certainly enjoyed this interview. Mark Gallagher, thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed.